<laughs> well, hello there, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I'm your host, Bishop A. Reginald Lipman. And this week, we are having a very special episode. I'm calling it the Thanksgiving Bible Study. So let me start by saying happy Thanksgiving to you from my family to yours. And we do pray that this is a remarkable holiday celebration for you and those that you love. Whether you're going to be alone or with a crowd of people, know this. God has great intentions for your life and the best is yet to come. So I'd love for you to make sure that you access the free PDF handout that goes along with this teaching tonight, as well as share this broadcast with a friend or family member, whether whether they are across the country or across the room, share it with someone to let them know what God is saying in this season of our lives. Also, please like, share, subscribe if you haven't done that. And when you do subscribe, make sure that you hit the bell notification so that you'll be notified every time new content is loaded. Well, guess what? This week, I want to talk about thanks living. You heard me right. Not thanksgiving, thanks living. That's really important because for many people, they have a mindset of gratitude really one time or one season of the year, which is Thanksgiving through Christmas. But I believe that it is God's expectation of us that we have a lifestyle of thanks living and not just an occasional mindset of thanks giving. And so I want to go into that this week and share with you. In a world that is often filled with challenges and negativity, it's very easy for us to lose sight of our gratitude because there's almost always something going on, always something happening. There's always a striving for more and more and more. But in the heart of the New Testament, Paul's letter to Thessalonians offers a, a very usable and timeless anchor for us. For in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 18, Paul wrote these words, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now listen, family, this verse is not just a call to gratitude. This verse is really an invitation to a way of life, literally called thanks living, not just thanks giving. Thanks living is a way of life that God wants you and me to embrace. You know, we live in a very fast paced, often tumultuous world. But this concept is more relevant now than it's ever been before. So the question becomes, how can we, amidst our modern struggles and uncertainties, really embody this biblical principle of continual thankfulness? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because I want to share the answer with you. As we lift up about four or five principles from this one verse that is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 18. And hey, I already know right now your house smells good just like mine does because my wife is an amazing cook. And I'm sure you probably got a turkey in the oven or something in the oven. And so I'm going to be really quick with this. So hang with me and we're going to get you out of here. But don't forget, you can go back and spend much more time with this than I have time to invest in it right now by grabbing the free PDF handout. You can find it right there in the description below. So let's go to the first principle for this week about living a life of thanks living. Here's number one. You must embrace gratitude as a lifestyle. Embrace gratitude as a lifestyle. Gratitude must be way more than just a thankful moment. It has to become a life of thanks living. 
And when you embrace gratitude as a lifestyle, you'll then understand how to really apply this action step that I'm giving you this week. Begin each day by listing three things that you're thankful for. I would love for you to do this, not for me, but for your future. Starting in the morning, list three things every single morning that you are thankful for. Now, I want to challenge you to go beyond church talk. He woke me up this morning. That's cute. But what is something that you are deeply, deeply grateful for? Besides, you know, food on the table, roof over the head, that's nice. But go a little deeper than that. Now, why is this necessary, you ask? Well, very simply put, this practice actually shifts your focus from problems to blessings. It aligns your heart with the scripture's call to be thankful. Because remember, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is our one key text for this week. In everything, give thanks. So, Paul is teaching us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18 that we need to embrace gratitude as a lifestyle. How do you get that whole concept out of that? He says in everything. So that means wherever life takes you, take and embrace an attitude of gratitude with you. And then it becomes a lifestyle. All right, here's point number two. So principle number two for this week based on 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, is find thankfulness in trials. Now, this is so powerful right here. Finding thankfulness in trials means that we are literally searching, almost like with a microscope, we are searching, magnifying glass in hand, for something to be thankful for in every trial. That's what Paul literally says in the King James Version. He says, in everything give thanks, not for everything. Let's be real with each other. It may not have been the easiest year as we uh, prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving, move into Christmas, move into New Year's Eve, move into 2024. It's not been the easiest year for me. There have been a lot of things that have happened this year from disappointments to sickness to setbacks to, uh, you know, expectations not coming to fruition. And I'm really talking about people expectations now that it's not been the most easiest of all my years on the planet Earth. So it's not easy to thank God for the difficulties. It's very difficult to do that, to thank God for the pain and the suffering and the agony that you may have gone through. But thankfully, that's not what Paul instructs us to do. He says, in everything, give thanks. Now, here's the key to it. Anything that you are in, you had to come into, which means if you come in, you can also go out. All right. So here's the key to this. If you learn to find something to be thankful for in it, I in, God will eventually end it, E-N-D, and bring you out of it, O-U-T. And if you thank him while you are in it, he will end it, bring you out of it, and then allow you to look back on it. And then you'll be able to thank him for it. That's powerful. So when we go into a trial, into a test, into a situation, it's hard to thank him for it at that point. But that's not the requirement. The requirement is to find something in it to be thankful for. So when you go through pain or surgery or heartbreak or heartache, here's the action step for this week. In moments of hardship, pause and reflect on what this challenge can teach you or show you and how it can strengthen you. That's how you find thankfulness in your trial, is by asking that question. What is it that God might be trying to teach me? What is it God is trying to show me through this experience? And trust me when I tell you, he's always trying to better you and not make you bitter. 
He's always trying to improve you and not disprove you or disapprove of you. All right. So find thankfulness in trials. All right. Let's go to number three, because we're not going to be long. We know it's Thanksgiving Eve. You want to get back to the family. So do I. So here's point number three. Share your gratitude with others. Share your gratitude with others. Here's what I love about thankfulness and thanksgiving and thanks living and an attitude of gratitude is that when you have an attitude of gratitude, you can't help but for allowing that to spill over on other people. So here's your action step for this week to practice point number three, actively express your gratitude to others. Whether it's a simple thank you note or when you get through eating the turkey and the chicken and the giblet gravy and the next day you're like, I don't want anything else. I'm sick. I don't feel like eating any more of this. And you decide to eat healthier by going to Subway for one day. When you get to Subway that day, express gratitude. The person who takes your order, give them a smile. Be extra kind. If they hand you a cup or your receipt, give them some gratitude. Share that gratitude with other people because here's what you will find. You will never put an attitude of gratitude, generosity, kindness out and it not be returned to you. Whether it is that person or somebody down the street, whatever you sow, you will also reap. Galatians. Six and seven says that. So when you share gratitude with others, it means that you're appreciative of everybody. You are thankful. You offer words of appreciation to others. You you offer a helping hand to someone. That might mean holding the door for someone or opening the door for someone. Let your gratitude overflow into the lives of other people and become an embodiment of thanks living. That's what it literally means to live. Thankfully, is thanks living and you share your gratitude with others. If you just tuned in, welcome to our Thanksgiving special edition Bible study. And this week we're talking about thanks living. I want to encourage you to share this with someone, leave a comment, and certainly to like, share, subscribe, thumbs up and all of that good stuff. And don't forget that you can get the handout in the description box below. Now, the handout has discovery questions with it, and it's going to go a whole lot farther than I'm going to go tonight. But that will help you to share it with others and even to show your gratitude for the effort that it takes to make all of this happen. So thank you for practicing point number three, even towards me. All right, here's point number four for this week, and we're getting ready to get up out of here. Point number four, cultivate a heart of contentment. So, When you have a heart of contentment, it means that gratitude emanates from your heart and you'll know it because it comes through your lips, through your lips. So here's our action step for this week to practice point number four. Regularly assess your desires and your needs, differentiating between the two. Now, here's what I mean by that. So many times we can overlook the blessings that we have as we are longing for the blessings that we see somebody else has. When is the last time that you went into your closet and looked at all of your pairs of shoes and said, Lord, thank you for the red pair of shoes. Oh, thank you for these boots. Thank you for my white sneakers. Thank you for my Jordans. Thank you for my Reeboks. Thank you for my Timberlands. Listen, That may sound silly to you, but let me tell you what will happen. If you cultivate a heart of contentment and really assess the things that you desire, the things that you need, the things that you have, it will make you so much more grateful for what you possess today. So find contentment in what you have rather than what you lack because we can easily focus on, well, so-and-so's got this. I don't have that. But it will be so much more beneficial to you spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and even financially 
if you stop and pause and take inventory of what you possess and what you have. And it will help you as you walk through your house and thank God for every lamp and, and the drapes and everything that you have because you recognize who your source is. So cultivate a heart of contentment. You don't have to go into debt this season. Let me go on and throw that out there. You don't have to go into debt and uh, overload your already too high of an interest rate credit card, maxing it out to buy things for people that they don't really want with money you don't really have. Oh, I just delivered somebody right there. Somebody ought to put something in the comments. I delivered you right there. Cultivate a heart of contentment and know that sometimes sharing and showing love is so much more valuable and necessary and needed and desired by people than something that comes from the mall. All right, here's number five, because y'all didn't like number four. Here's number five, family. Trust in God's goodness. Trust in God's goodness. Now, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, if you just tuned in, that's our key verse for the week. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When Paul talks about giving thanks in everything, he moves swiftly to attach a purpose to it. Why do we do it? He says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, which brings to home and to light point number five about trusting in God's goodness. What Paul is saying is God's will is attached to your pain. God's will is attached to your situation. God's will is attached to whatever you may be facing in your life. God wants to see how you're going to respond to whatever it is that you're facing in your life. So if indeed God has us in his will, no matter what the situation is that we face, it means this. Goodness is somehow or another going to come out of this. Mm. Goodness is going to come out of this. So you have to trust in God's goodness. I love Psalm 23, verse 6, as I close. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But guess what? You don't get to goodness and mercy in the house of the Lord forever in verse 6 until you go to verse 5 where it talks about God preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemies and anointing your head with oil and your cup runs over. But guess what? You don't get to goodness and mercy and dwelling in the house of the Lord forever in verse six or to a prepared table in the presence of your enemies in verse five, unless you go to verse four first. And it's in verse four that he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Watch this. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So you don't get the goodness and the mercy in the house of the Lord forever, the prepared table before you and the oil poured all over your head and all of those things and the rod and staff comforting you until you go through the valley experience in verse 4 of Psalm 23. So if you trust God in the valley, and maybe that's where you are tonight, in the valley of life or this morning, whatever time you're, you're viewing this or whatever year you're viewing this, you may be in a valley experience, but trust God that he will be good to you, even in the valley. And you'll see him bring you from the valley experience that's in Psalm 23, 4, right onto the prepared table. Watch this now. For those of you who are feeding people tomorrow, having guests over, or going to somebody's house, guess what you're doing right now? The night before, if you're watching this live, it's the night before Thanksgiving. You are preparing that table spread. Why? You know they're coming. And so when Psalm 23, 5 talks about preparing a table, it's because God knew that when the writer was in the valley, he would trust him and trust in God's goodness. That's why he says, I can go ahead and prepare that table and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here's your action step for this week as I close in moments of doubt and fear, reaffirm your trust in God's plan. And remember, thankfulness is rooted not in our circumstances, 
but in the faith in God's unchanging nature. Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to his unchanging hand. Hey, don't forget to grab the PDF as you get back to preparing those chitterlings for, <laughs> for supper tomorrow. Hey, the Lippman family loves you wherever you may be in this world. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Share this with somebody. God bless you. Have an amazing Thanksgiving. And tune in next week as we continue our series on the 12 disciples. Take care.